Hey everybody, this is your right geek, honorary man king, and leader of the Awkward Cough Squad. And I don't know about you, but I am really disturbed at this uh, new cultural revolution that seems to be brewing uh, in this country and in the West in general. Um, so I have a couple of things that I've written about various things that have been going on culturally that I'm going to share with you on this, uh, this audio recording um, regarding <coughs> this, this new yen to erase things that leftist radicals find offensive. Um, the first reading I'm going to share with you is something I wrote on uh, the visibility of cups in the media. Strong majorities agree that our police department should be reformed, that there should be more accountability when officers behave badly. But I think most reasonable people also agree that not every cop is a villain, that holding all cops responsible for the actions of George Floyd's killer is a gross miscarriage of justice. Why? Because that's simply not what we do in a liberal democratic society. We don't declare an entire collective guilty for the actions of a few. It's this foundational American philosophy that drives my positively revolted reaction to the new moral panic, the craze to expunge all positive portrayals of the police in our entertainment, our toys, etc. Cops has already been canceled, and now live PD, uh, and a clamor has arisen... <coughs> to purge our airways of the Law and Order franchise and similar crime dramas as well. And the Radicals are also going after Paw Patrol as of today, uh, which is also ridiculous. Further, I've seen calls for LEGO to stop selling its police-related building sets and whining claims that Zootopia and Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse are now totes problematic or whatever because they both feature characters who work in law enforcement and yet aren't complete bastards. Honestly, I'm just waiting for the day the Discovery Channel decides to cave and completely shutters its, its investigation Discovery offshoot. Sorry, you theory-addled utopians, but the police are probably here to stay. That means they do have a place in our popular media, whether you like it or not. And because both good and bad cops exist, both should be depicted. In fact, since the era of Hill Street Blues, at least, both have. I'm not really an expert on crime dramas. My tastes run more towards the hospital shows and science fiction. But even so, I'm pretty damn sure that said dramas have been grappling with the issue of police brutality and corruption for decades. So the idea that the mere existence of a cop show is going to somehow lie to the viewer about the reality of policing in America is pure nonsense that hasn't been true for a long, long time. Consider, too, what would happen if we made overreaction like this routine. What if a white doctor, for example, killed a black patient through his malice and or gross incompetence, and the story was covered in the national news? Would that mean we'd have to wipe out every hospital show currently in existence? Would that mean the Discovery Channel would have to black out Tales from the ER? Unless you think this is a bad analogy, no, the ideology that's presently driving this anti-cop madness claims that our healthcare system is also irredeemably racist. So a high-profile murder of a black patient would certainly be seen as emblematic of a larger issue that requires a radical response. I think those of us who are normal, those of us whose brains haven't been pickled by grievance studies BS, need to rise up and push back against these new cultural revolutionaries and their attempts to, quote, purify our recreation. These wild-eyed idiots need to be told in no uncertain terms that if they don't like seeing cop shows, then they shouldn't watch cop shows, and that they don't get to decide for the rest of us what we can enjoy in our spare time. F. Censorship. Uh, so that's the first little reading I want to share with you. And then the second one is about uh, the erasure of art in general. Uh, this one is entitled, Don't Destroy Cultural Artifacts, Contextualize. 
Um, and that's this is dealing more with art history and film history and the like. So in this one I wrote, When I was in college back at the tail end of the 90s, I took a class on the earliest days of cinema, which covered everything from the very first silent films to, roughly, The Wizard of Oz. Uh, and the reason I took this course is... Uh, I was taking a minor, in, a minor in American Studies, and this was one of the possible options. Uh, you know, obviously, as a STEM major, this uh, the, this wasn't something that I necessarily needed. This was just something that would be fun to take. I thought would be fun to take, uh, and it was pretty interesting. Um, but anyway, among the movies on the syllabus for this class uh, was *The Birth of a Nation*. Yes, that's right. I was required to watch D.W. Griffith's pay-in to the Ku Klux Klan. My professor didn't impose this requirement because he was eager to indoctrinate us all on the glories of white supremacy. Like 99% of the academics in his field, I'm guessing, he was a proper lefty. Lefty. No, we were required to watch this movie because, regardless of its repugnant message, my professor believed it to be a seminal work from a purely artistic standpoint. Now, I'm sure other students of film will take issue with this aesthetic judgment, and that's perfectly fine. Debate to your heart's content. But personally, I'm glad Dr. What's-His-Name didn't expunge the birth of a nation from the record simply to soothe our modern-day, more enlightened sensibilities. Now, let me veer off in another direction. A few years ago, I visited Stone Mountain in Georgia, not because I, a transplanted Yank, have any real love for the Traitor's Confederates pictured there, but because I was concerned about its possible loss. I literally texted to a friend that I wanted to see it before some apparatchik decides to sandblast that thing. Whatever you may say about a subject matter, said carving took the work of multiple artists and several decades to complete, and shouldn't simply be ground into powder, powder to satisfy our current moral impulses. And I'd just like to note for the record that every single person in my sky car could separate the artistic achievement of the carvers from the problematic history just as easily as I, even though, oh, by the way, I was the only one in that car who was white. Weird. It's almost like normal people of any color can look at questionable artifacts from bygone eras without getting the vapors. It's creepy, this yen our radicals have for erasing our history, this year zero mentality that imagines we can eradicate racism forever simply by clearing away everything that's been tainted by it. First of all, uh, that's not how human beings work. Cultural artifacts don't make the human beings. Human beings make the cultural artifacts. If you erase all the artifacts that are tainted by racism, that's not going to make racism go away because the racism is in the hearts of human beings. It's just going to appear in some other guys. I'm, I'm sorry, but that, but just cleansing culture of all racism is not going to get rid of racism. Racism. That's not how people work. Um, it's also wrongheaded because uh, all that icky stuff that dots our cultural landscape. If you advocate for the disposal of such things, you are quite frankly missing many important nuances. Gone with the wind might overly romanticize the Civil War era South, but as many on Twitter have observed, it also netted the first Oscar ever awarded to an African American. Erase Gone with the Wind, and you erase the achievement of Hattie McDaniel. There's a better path than wanton feral iconoclasm. You can put Confederate statues in museums. Or, if that's not possible, perhaps because, like the Stone Mountain carving, they're much too large to transport, put plaques beside them that fully explain their existence. You can erect accompanying installations that honor civil rights activists and abolitionists. You can put content warnings in front of uncomfortably racist movies. And I know a lot of people are listening to this who are kind of on my side of the aisle on this are going to go, eh, trigger warnings? I'm not so cool with that. But honestly, I'd be okay with that compromise if it meant we wouldn't censor anything. Because the censorship, I think, is way more offensive than just a little placard at the beginning that says, Warning, this is a historical artifact and might contain things that will offend your modern sensibilities. Fine, if we have to do that, that's fine. I just don't want the movies to be censored. Um, uh, do whatever you want, so long as it's creative and not simply destructive. 
it's very, very easy to, um, to, as I said, sandblast something that took many decades to make. It's much harder to think of a creative response to that art that you find offensive uh, and, to, uh, and to put beside it something that is comparable that people can look at and think about. Um, and, and, and what I want to do is I want to encourage people to pick that creative path instead of that simply destructive iconoclastic path. After World War II, Poland could have raised Auschwitz to the ground and nobody would have objected. But instead, it's been left as a memorial to human cruelty. Similarly, it permitted to remain our offensive statues and reprehensible movies could provide opportunities to critically reflect upon our mistakes. We should consider this option before we start applauding today's leftist vandals. Uh, so thank you for listening to my commentary uh, opposing the very idea of cultural erasure. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are on this matter. Please comment below, and I will talk to you again on Monday.